Okay, hello and welcome. This is the last uh, lecture of this macroeconomics course in the summer semester. Um, I hope you somehow enjoyed it. It was an experiment for us because in this specific uh, form, uh, I've never been teaching macroeconomics. Um, so I enjoyed it. I hope you also enjoyed it somehow. And um, if you have any comments, suggestions, um, they are very welcome. Um, we will record the whole lecture, the whole course uh, in August. So you have the chance then, uh, I would say by mid-August, to have all uh, the presentations, all the lectures uh, in a recorded uh, form. And, um, but as, as we have this chance uh, to, to record it a second time, um, we would be very happy if you could us could us give any kind of suggestion what you like what it is like i think that's the main challenge uh, for us in this uh, online form of uh, the course that we can't see your eyes we can't see whether you're sleeping we can't see whether they are nodding or whether you have any question marks in your eyes so that's normally very helpful uh, when you teach but definitely this is this is absent and Therefore, um, it's, it's more difficult for us, for me, uh, with this new format, with this new uh, course, uh, to see whether we did something positive or something negative. So please, I encourage you all, if you have anything uh, to comment, to suggest, um, that would be very helpful for us. Okay, so um, we have more or less gone through uh, the outline um, that we had in mind. And I thought today, for the last lecture, uh, it might be a good idea to discuss the macroeconomic aspects of the COVID pandemic. We have more or less touched upon uh, COVID uh, when we went through the course, but I think it's a good idea now to discuss explicitly COVID and uh, its implications for macroeconomic policy, especially for fiscal policy and monetary policy. Uh, you will realize when we go through this uh, lecture um, that uh, you have heard some of the things uh, that I will present you already, but I uh, think to repeat uh, basic concepts is also not, not a bad thing. So it's not entirely new for you what I will show you today, uh, but it's more or less applying the ideas, the concepts uh, that we have uh, had so far to the specific topic of COVID and macroeconomic policy uh, implications uh, of this uh, COVID pandemic. All right, good. Are there already some ideas on nobody? No? Okay, good. So, public debt in times of, of Corona. That's the title that I gave uh, to this lecture. because I said, it, it's, it's the macroeconomic aspects of COVID and it's uh, of course, the main focus on fiscal policy, monetary policy, and the mix, the interaction between fiscal policy and monetary policy. Okay, so how is it uh, with the COVID pandemic? Um, and uh, the chief economist of the IMF, Gita Gopinath, uh, said last year, it is a crisis like no other. And um, to underline uh, this uh, assessment, uh, I have made a chart where you can see the GDP growth, or more or less a GDP decline, um, in uh, the year 2020. And I've contrasted to the GDP declines developments in 2009. You will know that 2009 uh, was the biggest recession after the Second World War. And this recession was caused by the great financial crisis. And um, I think comparing GDP 2009 with 2020 gives you some idea of how uh, this COVID pandemic, um, uh, how this COVID pandemic uh, is uh, to be to be assessed compared to the uh, to the financial crisis. And uh, as you can see, more or less in all countries, the decline in GDP was much more severe than uh, in the financial crisis. The countries that are extremely affected by, by COVID, uh, Spain, Argentina, UK, Italy, France, and India, 
Um, and you can see here the contrast is really pronounced, much stronger decline than in the financial crisis. And I think one can explain this with the fact these are uh, countries um, which um, are very much affected uh, by the lockdown and the implications of the lockdown for tourism. Many of these countries are very much dependent on tourism. Uh, India is, has been very much affected by, the, by, the, by COVID. So there are countries that really uh, had a very, very hard time uh, with, with this uh, pandemic. And um, you can also see that China um, was relatively successful um, in, in the pandemic. But on the other hand, if you compare it uh, with 2009, where growth in China remained more or less stable also, uh, we had this the financial crisis. You can see that also here, situation is, is very different uh, now in 2020 compared to uh, 2009. So um, and how uh, can we explain this uh, crisis uh, in economic terms? Well, um, the COVID pandemic is a simultaneous supply and demand shock, a severe demand shock and a severe supply shock. The demand shock is, is mainly related to the lockdown, which meant that for many businesses, uh, their demand dropped from 100 to zero. And of course, this is, is uh, above all the service sector, uh, hotels, restaurants, um, but also uh, congresses and, and travel airlines and so on and so on. So there is a very severe demand shock uh, for, for many, many uh, businesses. At the same time, uh, COVID also meant a supply shock due to the lockdown in some countries, people weren't even allowed to go to work. Um, then um, the supply chains were interrupted and, uh, and parents had to stay at home uh, because the school was closed. So it was this combination of a supply shock and a demand shock, which is, is unique, which has led to this very severe decline in, in output all, all over the world. So how did fiscal policy react? How did, poli did economic policy react? I would say in almost all countries, the reaction of economic policy, which means fiscal policy and monetary policy was, was overall uh, very fast and also uh, very, with a very strong dose. And um, in, as a result, it prevented a, a, a continuous decline of the global economy because uh, we only have this decline in GDP in 2020. I don't have a chart for 2021, but uh, as you will know, all over the world now growth has come back and a continuous slowdown, a great depression of the global economy could be prevented. And I think this, this is a main contrast to the, I would say the most serious crisis that we have, economic crisis that we have experienced uh, in the global economy. And this most serious crisis was a great depression which started in 1929 and lasted until 1933 and which was a continuous decline of GDP over four years. Uh, and, and the decline was about 20% for most countries. At the same time, uh, we had a deflation, a uh, real outright deflation. So consumer prices dropped also by about 20, 25%. Um, and um, so uh, the positive thing is after the decline in 2020, we see now that uh, the uh, economy is back on a, on a growth, growth track. And uh, the explanation for this is that in 2020, 2021, uh, we have seen a very strong response of fiscal policy in trying to stabilize uh, aggregate demand. And here again, it's quite instructive to compare uh, the dose of fiscal stimulation in, in the current crisis uh, and compare it to uh, the, the uh, fiscal deficits in, in during the great, uh, uh, great recession, which was 2009, 2010. So you can here see the fiscal balances and I've made an average of 2009, 2010, and I compared with the average of 2020, 2021. And you can see almost everywhere uh, the deficits are higher uh, than in um, uh, 2009, 2010. So there was, fiscal policy was more 
more uh, active uh, in, in the current crisis and uh, what also uh, is, is obvious that the United States uh, is, is leading in terms of uh, fiscal uh, expansion. Um, so the, the deficit, deficit, aggregate deficit, average deficit uh, in 2020, 2021 is almost 16% and it's almost twice. So here it's the US deficit uh, right now, and you can see it's, it's almost twice the deficit in the euro area. So United States have very actively tried uh, to, to stop the decline in economic activity. Um, the euro area, they've also done it, but uh, less, less forceful. Um, what are the measures with which you can stabilize the economy in such a situation? I think uh, an instrument that was very helpful uh, in Germany, but also in other countries, is the instrument of short-time work. And short-time work means that uh, uh, the working time uh, of, of employees can be reduced uh, almost even to 200%, but without dismissing that, them, so people do not lose their job, they only work less. And uh, this means the reduction of working time means that the, the companies uh, can do not have to pay the same amount of wages, so, so their wage bill is reduced, and the shortfall of wages is compensated uh, by, by the government, so people receive uh, compensation of the loss of the regular income by government transfers, and I think that's also a very nice uh, uh, instrument because people still have their job. I think psychologically this is much better than if you sit in the lockdown, you have all the troubles, and you also know you no longer have a job, so short-term work means you still have your job, but during the lockdown, down, uh, you, 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 do not, you do not have to work. And the income loss is compensated to a very large degree by government transfer payments. So I think that's a very, very good um, instrument. I think it's been used in different forms by, by many countries. And it, it was a positive instrument both for the companies and, uh, and the workers. Uh, other uh, instruments, of course, were, were um, uh, uh, transfer payments, grants to, to companies uh, to help them to cover their, their fixed costs, uh, their leases and, and their interest payments. So overall, I think the governments have done a very, very good job uh, in, in stabilizing uh, the economy. Um, and to give you some idea uh, of the uh, fiscal support uh, of, of governments. You can see here uh, statistics by the International Monetary Fund, uh, where you have here where you have on the left side, additional spending and foregone revenue, so active stimulation measures, which directly uh, have a, a, an income effect on, on, on companies and on workers. And here you can see that again, see the same picture that the United States have been extremely active to boost their economy, you can see here in blue, the Euro area countries, uh, especially Spain, France, and Italy could do much less. And of course, they were afraid that by doing too much uh, stimulation, they would get into trouble with their already relatively high debt levels. Um, and uh, as a consequence, you can see that, that these countries, here Spain, France, Italy, um, that they try to help their companies with, with, with loans, with guarantees. So they try to help the countries out, the companies out uh, on the liquidity side, um, which is also quite helpful. But of course, for companies, better if it gets direct transfer from, from the government money that, that it doesn't have to repay. And uh, loans and guarantees, of course, uh, they have to be repaid. So, but you can see here the difference in the response countries with high public debt levels uh, were were afraid to, 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 uh, to, to spend too much in direct transfers and they try to help directly with loans, equity and guarantees. So we had this crisis, we had an unprecedented uh, uh, response uh, of fiscal policy and overall really helped to stabilize these economies to prevent much worse outcomes. And if you, uh, if you uh, consider that we have now this very long period of first wave, second wave, third wave, the uh, lockdowns, uh, 
and all, all this. So in retrospect, I think one can say, given this enormous challenge uh, posed by uh, the pandemic, uh, the economic outcome overall is, is relatively positive. So I think this policy has done a very good job. And of course, it was supported by monetary policy. We'll talk about this soon. But I think that's something positive one should stress because uh, if you follow all the debates in the talk shows, uh, everybody's complaining about governments doing terrible things and acting too late and whatever. Um, but the positive message that a, a serious slump, a serious deflation of the global economy with an enormous increase of unemployment figures, that this could be avoided by a very prompt and, and strong reaction of economic policy. That's something which somehow gets lost, but I think one really should stress this. So it's interesting. So we talked about uh, the differences uh, in fiscal policy in the United States and the Euro area. And uh, uh, we could see that the main challenge in the economic constitution of the Euro area is the lack of integrated fiscal policy, that there is no federal level that is able to respond um, strongly and, 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 and forcefully in, in a recession. Uh, while, of course, in the United States, you have this federal level. And um, I, I showed you already a chart like this, uh, comparing fiscal policy in the euro area and in the United States. So you can see that uh, not only in this crisis, but also in the, in the financial crisis, uh, uh, fiscal policy in the United States was able to react much more actively than in the euro area. And of course, this is a fundamental structural problem of the monetary union uh, that we have this common currency, but we do not have an integrated fiscal policy. And um, as things stand today, I'm not sure whether it will be possible uh, to go forward with political integration in the euro area. Uh, so that we, uh, that the member states are willing to transfer fiscal policy responsibilities to a European level, something that would be required to have a strong federal level in the euro area. But this is something um, which is not very likely. So the euro area will have to live uh, with this uh, structural uh, deficit compared to the United States. And again, I think this chart I've already shown you, also shown you that um, you can see that if you have recessions, they are stronger in the euro area uh, than in the United States. Uh, you can also see again, that's the chart I've already showed you, that due to insufficient fiscal stimulation, uh, uh, or one can say due to the austerity that was required by, uh, by yeah, politicians, especially in, in Germany, uh, but also by, by the MF, and, and the European Union, due to the austerity, you also had here this uh, kind of second recession. Uh, so it's the euro crisis here, this second recession in the euro area uh, after 2009. So that's a financial crisis. Of course, it is COVID. All right. So um, this is almost everything about fiscal policy. And uh, I think something that is also of, of interest is to see uh, what are the medium term output losses uh, caused by uh, the COVID pandemic. And this is a, a chart uh, from the OECD. And the OECD um, has made a calculation saying, OK, what did we expect in 2019 where the GDP of a country will be in 2022? So that's the, 2019 forecast for 2022. And then they said, okay, and what is today, 2021, our forecast for 2022? And comparing the 2019 forecast for 22 with the 2021 forecast for 2022 uh, is, is a way to uh, assess the medium term output loss caused by the pandemic. And here one can see that, especially the uh, uh, emerging market economies but also Spain, which is of course not an emerging market economy. Uh, the emerging market economies were suffering very much uh, from the crisis. Um, uh, I would say partly due to the uh, more difficult uh, 
health situation in these countries, um, but maybe also due to the fact that they were not able uh, to, to run as high deficits as the United States or, or Japan or other countries. Relatively positive assessment, quite interesting for China, United States and Germany here, you can see that these countries were even, even better now uh, in, uh, than, than one the OECD expected in 2019. Um, so that's in the United States, one can understand it because they had this very strong fiscal stimulus in China. One can also understand it because China also did a lot in terms of fiscal um, stimulation. Germany, it's somehow surprising, um, but maybe the OECD was too pessimistic for Germany in 2019. But anyhow, so it's quite, quite interesting. So this is, these are the output developments and fiscal policy response and the result. I think I've also shown you a chart like this before. The result, of course, is if you have very um, high deficits and if at the same time output contracts, the debt to GDP level where you have um, the nominal debt uh, in the numerator and GDP, nominal GDP uh, in the denominator, of course, debt to GDP ratios increase um, quite considerably in, in some countries. And uh, so you can see, see all over uh, all countries a, a pronounced increase in debt levels relative to GDP. Um, interesting fact is certainly that the United States, you can see that the increase is relatively strong. So the United States is now approaching something like 130. Um, uh, Japan, which was already very high, has now exceeded the 250% level. Italy is some, somewhere like 150, 160. And um, compared to this, Germany is still uh, still uh, one of the best performers. So that level has increased somewhat, but it's a little bit above 70%. And um, so it's quite interesting that these relatively low debt levels, I think there's probably no other country in the world where the population where, where people are more scared about the public debt than in Germany. Uh, so in Japan, uh, I've never seen uh, any, any debates on high debt levels and um, the need to repay all this debt. While in Germany with a very low, relatively low debt level, uh, there is this is a very intensive discussion. So this is, um, and, and what this shows, and we talked about this also uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, is that the Maastricht reference level of 60%, which is the anchor for fiscal policy, still the anchor of fiscal policy, uh, in the euro area is really not outdated, so it's, it's out of reach. And um, outside uh, Europe, there's no country where people are leading discussions that somehow debt levels have to be reduced to 60%. So in the United States, I don't see uh, any kind of debate uh, saying now 60% should be, should be the guiding post for, for our fiscal policy. Nobody cares. And yeah, in Japan, this. Well, they have 260, they can say, okay, we just add two uh, to 60, 200 to 60, then we have, uh, we have reached the 260 debt threshold. So it's a very Euro-centric discussion, and we can also say very German-centric discussion, because uh, German uh, policymakers uh, have, have a very dominant role in, in the Euro area, and they're also uh, the, the Dutch. Uh, and the Austrians who have similar, similar strict approach to fiscal Germany, uh, to, to, to fiscal policy like, like Germany. So the kind of Germanic alliance uh, where this strange, strange uh, idea dominates that that, that 60% debt to GDP is, is, is useful uh, anchor for fiscal policy, but we'll have to see. So we have now this strong increase. We have, we have these high deficits, which might be very fine. Uh, given the immense shock of the pandemic, uh, we had increase in debt levels. And of course, the question is how, how was it financed? And you will know this already. Um, more or less, central banks have been willing to finance the whole additional debt that was caused by the pandemic. So the increase of 
um, gallon bonds in the balance sheets of central banks is um, more or less identical uh, with, the, with the increase in, in public debt. Uh, I think in, in some countries, uh, central banks have even purchased more gallon bonds than required by the financing needs of the pandemic. Uh, and you can see here that very active central banks uh, purchasing um, gallon bonds. And other assets are, are, are the, are the Anglo-Saxon countries, quite interesting, New Zealand, United Kingdom, United States, and Canada. So uh, the, uh, the uh, increase in, 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 in bonds and corporate bonds and government bonds uh, is 15% or even more, so it's more or less a whole deficit. The euro area, and one has to say, these, these are the purchases until April 2021. So the, of course, it will increase uh, during the year 2021, uh, where of course the deficits are still high. And the ECB is purchasing, and the other central banks also are purchasing large amounts of government bonds each month. month. So this is not the end. So it's just kind of uh, uh, interim uh, statistic, and you can see, but you can see overall um, the uh, asset purchases of the central banks uh, are very high, um, and. Um, and if you compare the United States with the euro area, uh, this reflects the fact that the deficit in the United States was twice the deficit in the euro area. So it, I think the difference in the asset purchases of the same bank reflects the differences in the deficits in the euro area and in the United States. And as a result, now central banks hold considerable amounts, considerable shares, uh, of the total outstanding amount of, of government bonds. Uh, Japan, is central bank, holds about 50% of the, of the government bonds that are outstanding. Um, the ECB, and, and indirectly because the, the German bonds are held by, by mainly by the Deutsche Bundesbank, the ECB also holds also, also uh, about 40% of the of the German government bonds, so there are really considerable uh, um, stocks of of uh, government bonds now in the portfolios of, of central banks. And as I said uh, last week, uh, by purchasing uh, the government bonds of the euro area member states and by holding them in the uh, balance sheets of the central banks of the member states, you have some kind of indirect euro bond uh, solution because now the euro system, which means ECB and the national member state central banks, uh, they are holding a portfolio of um, government bonds, um, which, which are uh, national government bonds. And on the liability side, uh, there's simply the reserves that the banks hold uh, with the ECB. And so that's a kind of uh, mutualization of, of government debt by, by the ECB. I, I said last week, this is a kind of pragmatic approach. So if, if policy makers are not willing to adopt an outright mutualization of euro area debt, the ECB is doing it in this kind of indirect approach, purchasing large amounts of common bonds. And this is, and then, uh, and, and uh, uh, converting these, these government bonds in uh, ECB reserves, and that's kind of indirect, uh, indirect uh, euro bond. Okay, so, and I think that's something uh, we have addressed, uh, I would say, I think two weeks, four weeks ago. The interesting thing is now that in this crisis, the ECB has behaved completely different uh, compared to the 2009 period, and I would say one of the main mistakes and we talked mistakes we talked about is that the ECB was not willing to do any any form of active uh, quantitative easing of actively purchasing government bonds uh, in the uh, financial crisis and also in the years following the financial crisis, which in my view was one of the main reasons why we had so many problems uh, on, on the capital markets uh, with the government bonds of the euro area member states of the ECB uh, behaved completely passive. And if you look here in comparison, what the Federal Reserve did, how, what, what a huge amount uh, 
of government bonds, but also private bonds, mainly real estate related bonds. The ECB was, uh, the Fed was purchasing, so it did a very active job in stimulating the US economy in the financial crisis while the ECB behaved completely passively. And now, thank God, we have, it, we have the same, more or less the same approach. The ECB is now willing to contribute actively to the stabilization of the euro area in such a crisis. And that's why, thank God, so far we haven't seen any kind of tension uh, on the capital markets. So there is no kind of capital flight out of, out of Italian government bonds. There are no risk premia for Italian uh, or Spanish or Greek government bonds. So thank God with this new approach, the ECB has, has, has allowed uh, fiscal uh, policy to do its job in the euro area without generating new tensions and pressures. Uh, and euro crisis, something which, which is going to be definitively a disaster given all the other problems that, that we, with which we are confronted. And you can see here also again the difference um, if you compare the euro uh, bond yields with the US treasury bond yields, you can see that in, in the um, period of the financial crisis, the years following the financial crisis, there was a huge difference between uh, the bond yields, government bond yields in the euro area, uh, which was was uh, yeah definitely a problem for the for the member states. While now we have just the opposite. So now uh, the euro area um, euro area bond yields are, are very low, which really helps the euro area to get through this crisis. Okay, so far any questions? Yeah, we just have one question. Uh, what are the possible financial effects that the spread of ten-year government bond yields is higher in the US than the euro area? Right now. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, well, um, the spread started in this period, um, and in, in here you can here you can explain it relatively easily. In from 2014 to 15, we had very strong bond purchases by the ECB. That was Mario Draghi. Uh, who really was trying to prevent the deflation in the euro area. While there were no more purchases of, of government bonds by, by the Fed, so they have stopped the quantitative easing. So yeah, it's relatively easy to explain. And of course, it also has to do something with the short-term interest rate. So uh, I, as I said, uh, said three or four weeks ago, that the long-term interest rates also reflect the short-term interest rates. And um, so the economy of the United States was relatively strong in 2017, 2018. And so the short-term interest rates were increased and then also was then reflected in the, in the long-term interest rates. And I would say this may be also the explanation now for the uh, developments in, in this area uh, where uh, now everybody knows that the US economy will be under full steam and that an increase in short-term rates might be required relatively soon, but the euro area economy is still weaker and it will take more time until the ECB will increase short-term interest rates. I think that's, I would say, has, has to do with this, uh, with this um, expectation series of, of interest rates, but still, uh, the, it's still a good question because the, the Fed has purchased so many uh, government bonds, so it, it could, it could have prevented it maybe by buying more government bonds. So we talked about this yield curve control. And if the central bank is really committed to prevent increase in long-term bond yields, the, ECB, uh, the Fed could have purchased more bonds. But, but anyhow, but it's a good question. But I would say it reflects both the expectation of, uh, of uh, increases in short-term rates in a relatively short period of time, and maybe also the willingness of the, of the Fed to allow this increase uh, because uh, the, the US economy is now really uh, confronted with a kind of inflation risk. And therefore, I think maybe the Fed was also happy to allow this kind of, of, uh, of uh, allow this kind of, of monetary, um, indirect monetary contraction by somehow lower, uh, higher long term interest rate. So, again, good, good question. Yeah. Thank you. So, I think this we can do relatively short um, because we discussed it in detail. But in my view, what we now 
can observe in this pandemic the reaction of fiscal policy, the very strong reaction of fiscal policy and the 100% or even 100% plus financing of all the activities of uh, the, the governments is something which is, comes very close to what, uh, what the concepts of, of modern monetary policy imply. And um, I fear just uh, some, some quotes of, of which you already know of Rogoff, Summers, Krugman, uh, that are obviously not very, very happy about modern monetary theory. And uh, I think we had this quote that Rogoff says it's modern monetary nonsense, Summers says it's a recipe for disaster. Krugman has this old, this old saying among uh, academics on if somebody has a new paper and then some, some, some people like to, to, to make this, this saying, there's much that is true and there's much that is new. But what is true is not new and what is new isn't true. So that's, uh, if, if you want, want to say something bad about about a new paper that somebody has published, you can can use this this quote, and so that's that's what Krugman said. And um, but I but I think this is really not an adequate way to to deal with modern monetary policy. And we already talked about this uh, this quote by Lerner, and I think the the main idea that Lerner presents is that the government is responsible for macroeconomic equilibrium. That's more or less what he says. And he says, if we don't have a macroeconomic equilibrium, if we have an excess of, uh, of demand over supply, if more aggregate demand than aggregate supply, then we will have inflation. And uh, if we have an excess of supply over demand, um, then, of course, there's a risk of unemployment and inflation. And what's quite important is that, that, uh, that uh, Lerner explicitly uh, also, also addresses the responsibility of the government also for, uh, for inflation, something which was not so much uh, come uh, in, in, the, in the last two or three decades. But I think here, especially in this, in this pandemic, you can uh, also, uh, also, um, yeah, present this uh, responsibility for the for inflation or for the price level, as you could say, because with a, with a completely passive attitude of the government, the result would have been a huge deflation of the global economy. It's something that uh, happened uh, in the 1930s. The governments more or less remained passive, and you could see. Enormous decline of the price level. So, by stabilizing aggregate demand, by preventing a continuous decline in aggregate demand, the government stabilizes both the employment situation, the out output, but also stabilizes uh, the price level in a sense of preventing uh, deflation. So, I think this uh, modern monetary theory, at least if you understand it in the way that Lerner presents it, uh, makes sense. And of course, the important thing is what this, this learner quote is that if the government needs funds to uh, finance the measures that are required to stabilize the economy, then uh, these funds should be provided by the central bank. And that's exactly what, what you can see now. So the government, that's the main difference uh, with the uh, 2009 crisis where the ECB was not willing to provide the funds to the member states. They did not purchase government bonds, but the member states had to get uh, the funds from the financial market, um, which is possible. But of course, it, it creates it creates um, creates tensions on the financial markets because there are not so many people who are willing to buy government bonds in a, in a crisis situation, uh, and therefore the easier way uh, and. and uh, the more effective way is that just the central bank finances these, these deficits. And that, that's what happened in the United States and in Japan and the UK already in 2009. But so this insight of modern monetary theory has now, uh, is also now present uh, for the European central bank. So that's why I think modern monetary theory is a good thing. And 
I think also this we discussed already, the main insight that comes now from the Keynesian, from the monetary approach for, for a large country, which is embedded in its national currency, there are no financial restrictions. I think that's what you can also observe in the case of Japan, but also in the case of, of uh, United States. And therefore it's a little bit of nonsense. In, in Germany, you sometimes hear people saying, we were only able in Germany to do all these stimulation measures because our debt level was so low. That's why it was so important that we had this uh, debt break, this black zero, because otherwise we would not have been able to do all these stimulation measures. And I've shown you uh, the chart with the debt levels and countries like France, like the UK, like the United States, uh, with much higher debt levels, but of course, without any problems able uh, to finance uh, their fiscal policy measures. And this is simply due to the fact that the central banks are willing to finance it. So this is not a very convincing argument uh, in the German debate. And what matters is, of course, uh, for modern monetary theory is that, of course, um, there are, uh, uh, are constraints for the government, but the constraint is not a financial constraint. It's a real constraint. It's the availability of, of real resources of commodities, of, of workers, um, of all kinds of inputs. I think that's, of course, a, res uh, a restriction that, that is present and that has to be observed. And uh, that's what Lerner explicitly mentions, Ex explicitly speaks of the risk of inflation if aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply. And um, so far in the, in the corona pandemic, uh, one can say that, that uh, that fiscal policy was, was really um, preventing uh, too low um, aggregate demand and therefore the inflation risk so far has been relatively limited. Um, something that already mentioned is, is that this uh, unlimited uh, financial um, uh, resources for, for, for a large, large country is something that does not apply to all the EU, to all the Euro area member states, because if you take Italy, uh, it's a relatively large country, but all the debt is in Euro, and the Italian Central Bank is not able, not allowed to directly finance the Italian government. And that's why we had this Euro crisis uh, in 2010, 2012. Um, but so far, with a very ample uh, uh, asset purchase by the ECB, thank God this problem. It's not, it's not been relevant. Um, I already, uh, already spoke about also the, the, the pitfalls of, of Krugman. And I think it's, I just want to repeat it because it's interesting that Krugman, who is so much uh, criticizing MMT, yeah, uh, that he obviously does not understand how these mechanisms function. I think that's something surprising. And that's why I want to repeat it. We already addressed this, but it's very nice to see Krugman saying, well, this is all nonsense and I know better because the true things I already know. And that this Paul Krugman um, is, not, is not able to, 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 to present uh, the financing of the US government in a correct way. Uh, and I think we just go to this, to this chart here because that's what, how he presents the financing of the US government is just the classical approach with this one um, all-purpose good. And the idea is the households have this all-purpose good. They have excess of the all-purpose good because they cannot save so much. Then they give the all-purpose good to the banks and the banks then transfer the all-purpose good, now he calls it reserves, to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve now hands over the all-purpose good to the government by purchasing government bonds. So this you can only understand if you have the concepts of the classical model in your mind. There's only the one uh, all-purpose good. Yeah? And of course, if there's only the all-purpose good, which cannot be created by banks and which cannot be created by the central bank, then of course, the only way for the government to obtain the all-purpose good is that the households decide, we don't want to eat it. 
we don't eat it. And as we don't eat it, which means we say we, we are able to hand over the all purpose good to the banks, which are able to hand it over to the central bank, and then finally give it give it to the uh, to the government. It's unbelievable that somebody with a Nobel Prize in economics is presenting such such, such a nonsense. And if you can look at the quote said here, however, household financing of the deficit isn't direct. Instead, it has taken the form of a sort of financial daisy chains. Family, families are stashing their savings in banks. That's here, first thing. Banks in turn have been accumulating reserves that is lending to the Fed. So the banks lend to the Fed, which these days pay, pays interest on bank reserves. And the Fed has been buying government bonds. It couldn't be worse. And it's really, in my view, it's unbelievable. It's like, like a doctor, uh, professor, Nobel Prize winner in medicine, who is unable to describe uh, the function of the heart and the lungs, how the blood and the air flows uh, in the body, presents it in, in, a, in a flawed way. It's, it's because this is not something to speculate about. This is not something we can say we don't know how it works, like how we know where the blood goes in the veins and the, and the air goes into the lungs and how the lungs and the heart interact. There's nothing, there's nothing to speculate about. We know it. And, and here we definitely know that this is wrong. But instead of an outcry <laughs> in the profession about such nonsense, nobody, nobody cares. It's, that also shows, um, so if, if the Nobel Prize winner in medicine would, would present a flawed uh, mechanism of how the lungs and the heart uh, uh, operate, uh, it, it would be all, all newspaper in the world uh, that is unbelievable, but but Krupen can present such non nonsense and nobody nobody cares about it. Okay, so I think we have already discussed this all uh, also how how it really works and and the mechanism uh, is is relatively simple, but it can just repeat it. So the first step is of course that banks are financing everything. The banks and the financial system finances in, it's in the monetary model. It's never the households. They don't finance anything, and they finance, finance nothing with their saving. And saving has no role whatsoever in the financing process. And that's a key difference between the classical and the monetary model. While the monetary model describes the reality: how the heart and the lungs, how the blood uh, and and the air, how these things flow in a human body. And of course. The, and the mechanism is uh, banks purchase bonds from the treasury, and as a result, the tre treasury gets deposits with the Fed, and the bank's Fed deposits decline. In the next step, the treasury makes payments, transfer payments to the private sector, um, which of course then are able to save. Um, and by these transfers, the household bank deposits increase, the treasury's Fed deposit decline, and the Fed banks Fed reserves increase. And in the final instance, the Fed purchases bonds from banks, and then the banks Fed reserve increase. So it's just the other way around. Household saving is not the source for the government financing, but the government financed by the banking system makes transfers to the household. And in the end, this enables households to save. Just, just the other way around. I think that's also important if people say, well, the classical model is for the long term and the Keynesian is for the short term. This is the only way how it works. This mechanism is <laughs> never, is never, has never some, something to do with, with the reality, neither in the short term nor in the long term. Okay, so you now it's quite interesting when we now see how it functions, um, that there is, of course, always a risk in modern monetary theory um, that if you use uh, make use of these mechanics uh, that you do too much of the good. And in the United States, one can see that the transfers made by the government to the household sector were very, very generous. So we can, these are the gray area, it's, it's government transfers to households. And you can see in this chart, the disposable income of US households. Maybe you don't see it so nicely in the chart, but overall you can say disposable income 
of US households was 21% higher in 2021, first quarter compared to the first quarter of 2019. And in between we had the COVID pandemic. It's also unbelievable that we had very strong decline in economic activity. And at the same time, the transfers of the US government were so generous that the households had about one fifth, that's, that's something, one fifth more in their pockets than two years ago. This is due to the very generous uh, transfer payments that were already, which already something already started with Trump. I think he wanted to bribe the households to, to re-elect him, but also Biden who just continued this approach with extremely generous paychecks to all kinds of households. And of course here when we discuss, maybe, maybe it has been too much. And uh, what we can see as a result of these very generous transfer payments is that the monetary growth in the United States is now really, really high, really high, completely unprecedented. You can look in the statistics back to the 1950s, you never had such an increase of the money stock. And um, you can also see the difference uh, compared with the, with the euro area. While in the euro area, we sometimes had such increases uh, in the money stock, which are also not so uh, um, so so enormous, here in the United States, something has happened which was really is really unique. And of course, one cannot exclude that if you give too much money uh, to the households, that they spend it, and that this this spending power is now confronted with a supply side, which after the pandemic is also not maybe not as flexible as normal times. And so what we can observe in the United States, it's now a pronounced increase in consumer price inflation. Uh, nobody knows uh, how this will continue. Of course, it somehow reflects the enormous de decline of, um, of um, the uh, uh, inflation rate uh, due, to the, due to the decline, of massive decline of energy prices in the first half 2020, but still it's, it's quite a lot. And, um, and the question that everybody asks now is, will this continue? Will it, will it um, how long will it continue? And uh, I must say, I, I don't know. So uh, what matters for inflation to become persistent is of course, um, we talked about this also, the so-called second round effects. So if this increase in inflation impacts on inflation expectations and people form considerably higher inflation expectations in the United States, much higher than the inflation target of the Fed, which is 2%. So if people now start to, to work with inflation expectations of let's say 4% and this goes into long-term contracts, then you can have the second round effects where inflation might, this high inflation might become persistent and might also increase. So far, it's not so clear. So inflation expectations in the United States are still moderate. So we have, uh, as, an, as an indicator for inflation expectations, we can see it from, uh, from uh, index bonds, so bonds uh, where the yield determines on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the actual inflation rate. And, and comparing these index bonds with non-index bonds, you can derive the implicit inflation expectation. And you can see here, while the inflation expectations have increased, the United States have not increased that much. So these are inflation expectations. One is a 10 year break even inflation rate, the blue one, and the other is a five year, five year forward inflation expectation. So expectation, what will be inflation after 2026? How will this inflation be? And so the positive thing is that so far, um, at least the financial markets have the feeling this will be a more, per, more temporary uh, development. So once people have spent all the transfers they have received during the pandemic, then the situation will normalize. And uh, I think for the second round effects, what really matters is the situation in, in the labor market and also the strength uh, of, the, uh, of the workers to uh, to get higher wage increase, if the inflation expectations go, go up, that they really get also higher uh, wage co contracts. And so in the United States, uh, the bargaining power of the workers is relatively low. So 
overall, I my personal uh, forecast is that um, it will be kind of temporary development and uh, we will go back to normal inflation rates, let's say, after one or one or two years. Okay, so we will make a very short break, five minutes, and then we continue. Thank you. Okay, so okay, so let's try the final uh, part of this um, presentation. Fiscal policy after the pandemic. So far, we talked about the challenges uh, fiscal policy during the pandemic, but hopefully sooner or later the pandemic will be over. And the question is, what does uh, this now imply for fiscal policy in this? Also, difficult periods after the pandemic, because once the pandemic is over, I think there will be still huge challenges for all countries. The challenge posed by climate change and by the need to decarbonize the economy, to transform the economies, also the challenges that are uh, uh, caused by, by digitalization. And so there's many things, many things to do for governments. The question is, uh, are they able to to finance uh, the transformation uh, of our economies that is that will be indispensable. So what about fiscal policy after the uh, pandemic? And I will start with Germany. And I think so far in this uh, course, we did not speak about the specific situation in Germany. And, um, and therefore, it's a good opportunity to address this uh, specific aspect. And Germany is a country uh, where you say that people are always afraid of, of too much government debt. Um, also, government debt is relatively low. Um, and uh, this fear of government debt also was uh, the reason for Germany to adopt the so-called debt break in its constitution in the year 2009, directly after the financial crisis. This was something a little bit absurd, because what we observed in 2008, 2009, is that the markets uh, can make huge mistakes. The financial crisis is, um, is absolutely uh, the result of, of huge mistakes by banks, huge mistakes by, by private investors. But it was obviously a market failure. Governments have also made some mistakes, but overall, um, it, it was a market failure. And the interesting response of the German parliament due to this huge market failure to the misallocation of financial funds uh, by the market uh, sector, uh, the response was <laughs> to say, now we decide that the government should no longer be allowed to act as an investor for the future, an investor who can raise funds on the financial market to finance uh, investments for the future. Because that, that's what the German debt break implies, implies that uh, the government cannot act as a, as a private enterprise and the private ent enterprise or company, if they see we have an interesting investment opportunity, if they see the return of this investment opportunity is higher than the interest rate that has to be paid uh, for, for loans, then of course, it's a good thing to, to uh, to do this, to do this investment, and it's, it's a mistake if you have profitable investments, if you have, can raise financial funds at low interest rates. <clears throat> if you don't do it, that's that's of course a mistake uh, uh, for, from a, from a, from from a, from a manager or from, from management of a company. And the astonishing uh, situation in Germany was that the, that the parliament decided no, we do not want the government to act like a private company to act as, as an investor uh, to use the opportunities uh, by, by raising uh, money on, on the capital markets. And so the debt break means uh, that overall uh, the, the government sector sh should have a balanced budget. And, um, and the, the, fed, for the federal government, uh, there, there is a very small uh, amount of deficit is allowed, minus 0.5%. But overall, de facto, it means the deficit, no, no deficit financing of investments by, by the Bund and by, by the lender. And in order to make this really binding, the whole thing was written into the German constitution. 
And so if you want to change it, you need a two-thirds majority in the parliament and also in the Bundesrat to change it. So this is now very, very, very firmly enshrined in our legal system. The debt break, uh, of course, has a provision that government, government deficits are allowed when there are major recessions. And especially when the country is, no, it's raining outside and it's sitting, sitting in the So it's, deficits are especially allowed in, the, in cases of natural catastrophes or unusual emergency situations beyond governmental control uh, and substantially harmful to the state's financial capacity. So there is in this, uh, Article of our basic law, there is an explicit uh, provision. So, of course, if the country is confronted with something like COVID, then uh, it's possible uh, for the government to raise as much money uh, on the capital market as it wants. That's exactly uh, what we can observe in Germany. So, we had last year very high deficits, this year very high deficits. And uh, this uh, special provision of the debt break will also be applied 2022. So, we have uh, for three years, we will have relatively high deficits. That's fine. Uh, the only problem is that the uh, authors of this uh, article, the basic law, um, said, okay, if the government debt increases due to the financing of deficits in emerging situations, each euro that is spent and deficit finance has to be repaid uh, within an appropriate period of time. And this is something which is economically very problematic, and I explain you why. And to see this, we just look at the situation after the financial crisis, so the situation 2009. What we observed in the financial crisis is that the debt in Euro, at levels in Euro increased by considerably because there were also major deficits required to stabilize the economy. The debt level, debt to GDP, increased even more because, as I already said, in the debt to GDP ratio, you have the uh, GDP, nominal GDP, uh, in the denominator. And of course, if the denominator declines, the whole thing increases even more. So this is what we had after the uh, financial crisis. And now the question is, how did Germany deal with the additional debt, this increase that we have observed here? Was it repaid? No. Uh, more or less, the debt level in euros remained constantly declined a little bit, but it was not reduced to the level that we observed before the crisis. Nevertheless, debt to GDP ratio went down to the 60%. Why? Because we had a longer period where nominal GDP was growing at rates of two to three or even a little bit more. Uh, so the financial crisis shows you that it's relatively easy to grow out of debt. There's absolutely no need to repay the debt. And it's only lawyers who do not understand the mechanics of, uh, of the debt to GDP ratio who get, have, get the idea that the additional debt must be repaid. And of course, the need to repay the additional debt means that the fiscal policy room for Nuber is, is very tight now in, in, for, for the years to come. Now, because comparing, so, so if, if, we, if we had the debt break already in 2010, the consequence would have been that, that we had that the debt level in Euro had to be reduced. Now, and, and but the option to keep the debt level in euros constant, constant by growing out of the debt and then reducing the debt to GDP level to 60% or something like this is no longer there. And what does it mean? It means that uh, the German government is forced to have surpluses for many, many years due to the need to repay to, um, to, 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 yeah, to repay the additional debt um, now. Uh, raised during the COVID pandemic. Here you can see that's the starting point. That's the federal budget. Uh, that's the leeway for, uh, for, for, for government deficit due to the debt break. That was minus 3.5%. Minus 
Um, but, and, but after 2026, the German government must have relatively high surpluses due to this amortization requirement. So the idea is that the COVID debt from 2020 must be repaid one twentieth, starting 2023. The COVID debt from 2020-21 must be repaid one seventeenth from 2026. And it means in euros that uh, an annual repayment of 2 million billion euros from 2023 and 20.5 billion of euro from 2026. So this completely um, yeah, flawed uh, idea that the government must reduce the debt level, the, the debt level in euros totally um, means this um, this uh, yeah this it means that there's a requirement for the government to have to have relative positive uh, have a po a positive balance uh, in its budget and means that the, that the small leeway that the constitution has given to the German government minus 3.5 percent is 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 uh, is taken away and instead the government must must uh, must uh, must achieve surpluses in its budget. And of course, that's money that's not available for investment in new technology. That's not, a, not available for investment in all kinds of measures to deal with climate change. And, and so uh, in Germany, we have the weird situation that Germany from its debt level and debt to GDP ratio is one of the least indebted major economies in the world. We are imposing on ourselves the most strict uh, restrictions for fiscal policy. And that's something that, of course, uh, will make it difficult for Germany to deal effectively with climate change, to, 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 to make it possible that uh, the climate change can be achieved in a way that is also uh, socially acceptable by, by the population, um, and also to have the funds to modernize our economy uh, in a way that we will remain competitive uh, also at the end of the decade. For the euro area, we have the requirement, we talked already about this, the so-called six-pack. And the six-pack is a regulation that was uh, decided in 2011. And the six-pack tries to make the debt reduction, which is already uh, in the Supreme growth pack to make this debt reduction really effective. And the idea is of the six pack um, that we have the 60% threshold mass retreated. We take the actual debt level of the country and the difference between the actual debt level and 60% has to be reduced within 20 years. So each year one fifth of the difference between the actual debt level relative to GDP and the 60% has to be reduced. And that means huge, um, huge uh, surpluses for countries with high uh, debt ratios. Of all, for Italy, you can just look here at, at this at this chart. So this is a kind of estimate I've made based on data of the European Fiscal Board. You can see Italy has a debt ratio of about 158 percent, and now um, one can calculate what what. Uh, primary surplus is required to achieve the 60% within 20 years. It depends now on the assumption that you have on, on Y and I. So Y is nominal growth, I is a nominal interest rate. So if you take a positive scenario where nominal growth exceeds the nominal interest rate, Italy must achieve a surplus of 2.9%. If you uh, if you take a less positive scenario where the difference between nominal growth and nominal interest rate is negative, Italy must achieve a surplus of 4.2% for the next 20 years. And if you compare it to the surplus, the primary surplus that Italy has been able to achieve uh, in the years before the crisis, so it means a huge monetary, a huge fiscal restriction. And I would say it's almost impossible. You can apply the same thing let's say to, let's take uh, Spain, which has a lower debt ratio, um, 
which would have requirements of 1.9 to 2.9 percent surplus, uh, but so far it had, it had a deficit of minus 0.5 percent. So more or less applying the six pack in a strict way would suffocate growth in the euro area for the next decades. And so hopefully there is a debate that somehow fiscal rules uh, in the euro area must become more flexible. We can only hope that this will possible, be possible because otherwise uh, in Europe, the euro area will not be able to meet the challenges uh, of the coming years and coming decades. I think this we just skipped, we hope it's already, I think we don't need that. And um, so to, to give you some perspective of what a strict fiscal policy framework implies is if you just compare the fiscal deficits of China and of the United States with the fiscal deficits in the, in the Euro area, and you can see already before the crisis, um, let's take these, these years, you can, take, you can take all the years, you can see always uh, the deficit in China was huge, really huge deficits for many, many years. In the US, it has been high, but it also increased during, during the Trump administration. And um, so in China, these very uh, huge deficit figures come not from the central government, but from the provinces. In, the, in China, the provinces are heavily indebted. Um, so there is lots of uh, funds on, on, from banks, from financial markets. And they use it also for a lot of, um, for a lot of uh, investments. So they, they subsidize, support industries come to these provinces, they give you the generous uh, uh, treatment, tax treatment, they, they, they provide them uh, with land and everything. So there's a huge support for companies by the provinces. And um, so with this ample support, ample support from the government, it's easier for, for innovative firms in China to grow and to be successful than in the Euro area where we have this very, very tight straight jacket of the stability and growth. You can see it also in the United States again, also here the government is much higher than this. So um, there is a risk if, if in Europe, especially in the Euro area and especially in Germany, if we think that the main priority is to have low debt levels, to reduce debt levels, to have fiscal austerity, if this is the main priority, the risk is high, that we will have major problems, not only with climate change, but also uh, with our competitors in China and in the United States, uh, where, where the policymakers have different priorities. I think the China and the United States, um, the policymakers uh, give the main priority to have competitive industries um, and to have new technologies and, uh, and uh, debt levels are of secondary importance. And so, this is a huge challenge um, for for your area. Uh, if if we think that uh, fiscal austerity comes first, um, then there is a risk that climate change and policies to deal with climate change and policies to make our uh, economies more competitive uh, are secondary. Okay, I would say we have now come to the end. Uh, if you have any questions now to what I've just said. Uh, or if you have any other questions, please ask. Um, so there's one question. What was the view of the German Council of Economic Experts on the debt rate before the law was passed? What the majority for it and why? Good question, yeah. Um, in fact, the, the German Council of Economic Experts wrote an expertise, as it was called, in 2007, where the majority was in favor of a debt break. I, or at that time, I also said, we don't need a debt break. So you could see, looking at public expenditures in Germany and other countries of the world, the growth of public expenditures in Germany was among the lowest. Uh, and, that, and in the years from 2000 to 2007 or so, uh, public expenditures in Germany were all, almost stagnant. So I, I didn't see any need to, for any kind of fiscal straitjacket for, for the German government, uh, which has been all very cautious in its spending compared to all other countries. Anyhow, the majority of the council said we needed that, but that's a very good question. The council said 
there is no need uh, to uh, to oblige the, to, to oblige the government to always have a balanced budget. So they explicitly said the idea that currency that a, the idea that a government is not allowed to to have a deficit is is as absurd as the idea to prohibit a private company not to have a deficit because uh, you can use um, deficits to finance investment and in this. Uh, in this expertise, the government explicit, the council explicitly said we, we, we need we need a kind of debt break, but we need a debt break which allows the government to finance investment with uh, with debt. So that was explicitly stated. Um, the only difference compared to the situation before we had the debt break is that the council majority said um, we want. Uh, the, we want uh, the debt financing only for net investment and not for gross investment. Net investment means gross investment minus depreciation, but for net investment, the council said, of course, it's important to have the golden rule, and of course, it's important to allow the government to make these investments finance and finance them uh, with, uh, with debt. Unfortunately, when we came to the to the discussions in the parliament, this was completely lost. And, um, and so the only thing that a little bit reflects the idea that some debt financing is needed is this allowance for the government, for the federal government to have a minus 3.5 deficit. So that's what I mean. But so to the fence of the council, majority must say they explicitly um, made, a, made a case for the golden rule, which means government investments can be financed with debt. Uh, can you explain the calculation on page 21 uh, oh. that the required primary balance? No, I cannot. So, so this I, I can give you the source. How this and so you cannot easily explain it, but uh, I can give you the source uh, which explains it in detail. So, this is a rough estimate, um, but I can, can give you the source where I can give you. Uh, where do you think it comes from? The Germany is so afraid of debts and accepts to fall behind China and the US. Pardon? Uh, where do you think it comes from that Germany is so afraid of debt and accepts to fall behind China and the US? That's a good question. So it's, it's something which is, so many people say it has to do with our history because Germany had, had hyperinflation in 1920, 1923. Uh, we also kind of, of, um, of uh, hidden uh, in, inflation in, in the second, second world war. So there was a currency which, which uh, required a currency reform in 1948, where money you had on your savings account was reduced by a ratio, by a relation of ratio of ten to one from ice market to demarc. So we had problems with this, but um, I've spoken several times today of this uh, Great Depression uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, the Great Depression was a situation with a huge deflation and. Uh, the immediate uh, outcome of this Great Depression with extreme high unemployment with the deflation uh, was that we had this Nazi government coming to power and with, with terrible consequences uh, for, for, the rest, for the rest of the world, but also for Germany. So our history should have, should have to, to tell us the most dangerous thing is deflation and high unemployment. But anyhow, it's, it's difficult. So they, sometimes I try to explain it uh, with the fact that in Germany, uh, in German language, the word Schuld is, 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 is not only debt in, the English, in English, but also guilt. So it has a negative connotation. So in, in English language, you have guilt. Some, somebody made something wrong. You have debt, which is a purely economic term. And in, in, in German, that's um, you, have this, you have the same word "schuld" for both phenomena, and maybe so that has some kind of negative connotation. I don't know it. It's, it's, it's very very strange. And uh, of course, the Germans are also suffering from uh, their their fear of debt because uh, while while in the German newspapers and magazines since, since 2010. You can read every day that inflation is coming soon. Uh, and Germans somehow believe that inflation is coming soon since 2010. But the interesting thing is that 
if you really believe in inflation, the best thing to do is to, to, to try to get a mortgage and to buy a house or an apartment. But Germans didn't do it. Yeah? They still had their money, all kinds of, of savings constructs uh, and, and kind of insurance products. And, and now, now, since 2010, of course, the situation has changed. Uh, real estate prices went up. And it's difficult for Germans. And so in many, I think in Berlin, uh, where you could really buy very, buy really very cheap uh, houses and, or apartments above all in 2008, 2010, the Germans didn't buy it. It was the people from, from the Netherlands, from all over the world who said, wow, real estate is so cheap in Berlin, let's buy it. And the Germans didn't buy it and now they complain, of course, that rents go up, that it's now really difficult to afford um, to afford buying, buying an apartment in Berlin. But this, really, this, this fear of debt is also something which the Germans do not only have in relation to public debt, but also private debt. That's why we have in Germany one of the lowest ratio of, of home ownership in, Germany, in, in Europe and the world. We have only what, I think 45% of people live in their own, own homes or apartments. I think in Spain, also it's 70% or even more most other countries in, in the UN area. Okay. So that was it. Okay. So thank you so much for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. So I very much regret that we didn't have any chance to meet in person. So that's really a very, very sad thing, but that's due to Corona. And um, let's see uh, how the uh, situation will develop. In uh, in autumn, so maybe maybe I don't know. Let's see. Maybe there's a chance that, that we can at least the ones of you that live in Würzburg that we maybe maybe can meet somewhere in autumn to say hello to each other and to, so that <laughs> we can get an impression who was who was attending. So maybe we, we will we'll see whether we find a, a possibility because yeah. So it's it's really for both sides. It's it's not not ideal. But let's be optimistic. Uh, that's fun that we get, uh, that, we, that we will be able to deal with the third or fourth, I don't know, many ways. And so please stay healthy, please stay happy. I wish you uh, all success for your examinations. And I really do hope that we have a chance to meet in person sooner or later. Bye bye.